Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. Before I jump right in, I wanted to kind of show you this picture that I have right behind me. It is from the uh, Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival, which is going on today. They're going to have a clinic with uh, the professionals at 1 p.m. this afternoon. You guys can go check that out. It is free and open to the public. You just have to walk on down over to the music uh, department at the University of Montana, go to the Denison Theater, and you can find all that kind of stuff and more. I went to their clinic on Thursday. Very enlightening. It, it was nice to uh, kind of listen to a lot of the uh, experts and people who are younger than me who are now the uh, jazz professionals. It's kind of crazy how like times have changed into seeing some new blood into the jazz community. Um, do you like jazz? No, <laughs> just kidding. All right, so I also wanted to mention that this is probably going to be the first year that MCAT has done, uh, actually uh, participated inside a parade since the uh, pandemic closed everything down uh, four years ago. And so the St. Patrick's Day Parade uh, uh, steps off at noon on Saturday from the Red X's and it's going to go well until the uh, the uh, roundabout that hits um, Higgins and uh, I, I guess it's University Avenue. I'm, I'm not entirely sure. I completely I'm blanking on it right now. All right. So actually, we're going to jump right into some city council. They're going to they talked a little bit more about uh, uh, evening out some of the short time rental uh, um, short time uh, short term rental and Airbnb. Uh, deals happening in the city of Missoula in terms of registrations, uh, getting permits and stuff like that. But before we actually get into that, uh, there was a public comment that was spoken at the beginning of the meeting uh, on the, uh, the way that the uh, city conducts their meetings. Um, and the format of the city council changed last uh, Monday and Matt Larson, uh, who has um, constantly spoken during public comment, speaks out against this new format. This is, uh, this is really troublesome. It doesn't allow for participation for some of our older um, and more um, technologically in advanced uh, participants. We need to have a definite location and time for public comments in, in uh, general public comments in the meetings. It doesn't have to be some sort of floating uh, moving target um, that we're, where we can just kind of wait out everybody. Um, that seems very unfair to the public, and uh, I'm very dismayed at, at this new uh, format. Okay, and so that was Matt Larson talking about his reaction to the format of the city council. And generally, the city council kicks things off with a uh, public comment, but this time they're uh, moving all their business to the front, um, including public hearings, and then uh, public comment is happening just before uh, words from the mayor words from uh, the city and staff uh, after the fact. Uh, so change is a hard pill to swallow and it's under the purview of the mayor and how they conduct business. However, some community councils across uh, the county of Missoula have many opportunities for public comment, especially per topic. Uh, then you can always submit public comment outside the meeting via email or even letters still. Uh, let's jump into the meeting as we're talking about the short-term rentals via code reform. Title V update would require owners of short-term rentals, which applies to a broader category than tourist homes to obtain a registration numbers from the city and require a listing platforms such as VRBO, uh, Airbnb to list the city's registration numbers on the listing site. So Stacey Anderson, city council member, uh, speaks on this further. We have given quite a bit of a grace period for people to get their application in, to get registered, to have the um, subsequent inspections that are needed, and to then have the number posted online. This is something that is happening in other communities, Bozeman, did this last fall and so we're able we are not the first ones to do this the uh, listing platforms know that this is coming have the ability to list it um, and this is just another way to encourage compliance within our regulations because as noted there are several um, hundred units that are currently not registered and you know it's it's one of those things that uh, any person's private property can essentially just become an Airbnb or turn into commercial um, rentals, uh, much like a hotel, but for a larger uh, scale. But and honestly, in some cases, you get a whole home for as little as two, three hundred bucks a night. Which you know, you know, if you get a hotel room, you can see them anywhere between 
uh, $150, $250. So there's a lot of opportunities, a lot of great uh, benefits from having this, but at the same time, uh, there were a lot of concerns when it comes to uh, issues with uh, the idea of longer rental units rather than just these short-term rental kind of things. Uh, Ryan Sudsbury, the city attorney, uh, spoke a little bit further on the legality of their registration process and what the city uh, came up with. The short-term rentals addressed here is kind of a broader term. Uh, if you have a, a tourist home permit under Title 20 or are required to go through that process and get that permit, you'll automatically get a registration number that qualifies for short-term rentals. Uh, but for those short-term rentals that are not tourist homes, those owner-occupied uh, units that are rented intermittently, um, this will cover that situation. And uh, so the CPDI staff will have a information on the Engage page or on the CPDI website that identifies what's expected for each type. And then when somebody comes in, if they're unsure, the staff will uh, guide people into the, the correct uh, permitting process. All right. And that was Ryan Sudsbury, the uh, city attorney. Uh, overall, they just wanted this to be streamlined and help people start a tourist home rather than signing up for an app and going from there. Um, M uh, Mike Wilson, a resident, talks about the bigger picture in terms of rental properties and ownership in general. If you're already established, people coming and investing can be great. But for people who already live here, it's not such a great thing. It sucks to have to experience growing up in this city or in this state and realize that it's becoming so incredibly difficult because of out-of-state investment. We need to make sure that we don't set ourselves up for failure when it comes to the whole, the conglomerate, all of the people. Some people will stand to benefit, but we need to make sure that everybody is being looked out for. And I think one of the bigger takeaways from uh, what a lot of citizens, a lot of public comments when in terms of having to, some kind of register for a lot of these uh, vacancies in people's homes or people's properties in general and just to be able to find out uh, exactly the um, availability with rentals, housing stock and all the stuff like that. And uh, overall this is just tightening some of the loopholes to ensure compliance for folks who are applying for short-term rentals slash Airbnbs. Uh, you know, it's a school of two thoughts. People turning their property into short-term rentals to maximize their profits and the other is private property becoming commercial uh, rent, uh, rentals has a detachment to the community or uh, best argument people can do whatever they want with their own property. Um, moving on, uh, Aaron P. and Cowsey and Community Planning talks a little bit more about the numbers in terms of Airbnbs that are in compliance. Um, Short-term and tourist home operators who are not currently registered with the city who are going to be coming in to register with us. Right now that is done through a paper application and processing 260 paper applications is going to take extensive staff time. It's not an efficient use of time for both the applicant and for our team. And so we're working with a consultant with our Acela system, which is our business permit and business licensing system to create a module so folks can go online and do that. All right. And so uh, for those of you who already have an Airbnb and have already applied for the old ways of doing it, your number is still good. All you have to do is just uh, present that and uh, get updated with the registration. It's a very short process compared to people who want to start one. Um, on the consent agenda, it, it included the Ivy Franklin Street project, which included those sidewalks. I sp I've been speaking about this for the last couple of weeks because it seems to be one of those big kind of hot topics in the city of Missoula because when it comes to sidewalks, the city builds it, but then the residents in the general area pay for it. Um, and a lot of people are not really happy about these kind of things. And so, um, it's, it's a weird thing, just sidewalks in general in the city of Missoula because it's not technically rolled up into roads or anything, any kind of district or part of the general fund in general. Um, uh, Catherine Kimball, who lives in the Ivy Franklin Street, uh, who is uh, impacted by this project, is concerned about approving this project because of funding after the fact. This year of the highest property tax increase in the history of, Mis of Montana, that's not the year to stick a senior couple on social security with an extra nine thousand dollar bill and i have to say uh, no i am not going to pay the city government interest payments plus administrative fees for the rest of my life to finance what i feel is a non-priority looking at those other 15 areas that are above 
East Frank 100 block of East Franklin Street. It's misprioritized, it's not urgent, it belongs in the city budget, and so no, I'm, I'm not gonna do the pay you guys, not you guys, but pay the city interest and administrative fees on top of that. All right, and so that was just a part of the, uh, many of the processes. There's a lot of people who are on a fixed income, and I spoke about the pass on sidewalk progress, are one of those things the city likes, but people have to get the brunt of the cost because unlike roads, there is no road district's funding mechanism for sidewalks, uh, so residents do have to pay. So William uh, Fleischman, a resident, spoke on this as well, and this is what he had to say. I was shocked that the uh, Missoula City Council would pick this year to force two retired seniors to pay an additional $9,000 for a greenway project that nobody wants in a quiet neighborhood, ranked 16th in priority by city engineers for missing sidewalks. We've lived in our home for 32 years and we hope to continue to live in our home, but this assessment severely affects our ability to remain in our home. It's especially hurtful to us because we see the real need in Missoula for sidewalks in the other 15 areas. All right, and so that's uh, the comment made by Fleischman. Um, I mean, property values go up because of sidewalks, uh, but when we got reassessed in the state, a lot of people's property uh, um, assessments w in value went up, which means the property taxes went up as the uh, rates to uh, change to reflect those. You know, I saw a home, home, off, uh, home for sale off uh, Eaton Street, which they had their major development. They actually got grants to help build a sidewalk um, from 7th to about Mount Street, uh, roughly for a major sidewalk improvement area. Um, I mean, it might be coincidental, but at the same time, um, this, the people in that stretch of Eaton Street sidewalk area still had to pay upwards of $86,000 total in that area, which w went to go help the, uh, um, the grant to, to be awarded to this development in the first place. So Daniel Carlino, City Council, responds to our sidewalk system, and this is his opinions on this. Um, I mean, I could talk all day about this, but, um, you know, just six blocks away from this project, simultaneously, we're creating other city sidewalks and guess what nobody no individual household is having to pay for those we as a city are covering those costs over in montana and idaho street but for certain streets we charge homeowners individual households nine thousand dollars whether they can pay or not and if they can't pay then we charge them even more as a city with our current policy um, so i just think if we're if we're worried about through interest rates to clarify that um, but if we're worried about property taxes and worried about the financial burdens on homeowners this should be at the top of our mind as well because this is a huge financial burden that is clearly negatively affecting people. And I've heard from a dozen constituents live along this project. So I'm, I'm standing up with, with them and I'm gonna vote against forcing them to pay thousands of dollars. Um, I will still vote for doing sidewalks, but the way that we're paying for it is absolutely absurd. And I don't think we should continue this in the future. All right, so that was what Dan and Carly know how to say. Unfortunately, it, um, well, uh, out of the three uh, that said dissent of this project, we'll continue to move forward for the Ivy Franklin Street uh, Greenway project in which they'll be putting in sidewalks. So moving on, we're going to talk about public safety and health, which they're talking about updating ordinance to prevent sweeps of homeless encampments during um, intense weather events, whether it be intense heat or intense cold. This is one of many issues that the city got flack for when dealing with encampments over the winter. This is a false idea that if you build it, people will stay in shelters and those who have temporary exits after the fact. So Aaron Pierin, Housing and Community Planning responds to the uh, resolution on behalf of Mayor Davis. Um, and this is what she had to say about this. Statement. Um, I agree with Councillor Jordan that camp cleanup should not occur when the weather could cause an additional hardship on our homeless neighbors. And it is city practice not to do this today. However, I do not support the mechanism being presented in an ordinance or resolution for these reasons. We are all participating in an urban camping work group this spring with the intent of developing actionable policy recommendations for council to consider, creating a singular policy decision that should be considered as part of a larger set of recommendations in March with unseasonably warm weather is not necessary and ignores the valuable input that will come from the working group process. 
Secondly, there is no codification in Missoula Municipal Code about the specific enforcement of any of the codes that may be applied related to these cleanups. Creating a singular piece of enforcement in MMC creates an unwieldy issue in the code. All right. And so that was Aaron P. and talking a little bit more about that. There's, uh, and, and then they, as they go further into this meeting, they actually refer to this as in terms of the people who do the cleanup uh, to make sure that this, uh, they want to clean up, but they believe this resolution wouldn't benefit the cleanup crews trying to work while at the same time addressing the issues that in this resolution without passing anything. So they'll just add it to the policy and they don't need to have it codified in a resolution. But uh, Nicole Gomez from uh, Missoula Women Votes wants to support this resolution uh, just because it will codify in writing about how we approach um, uh, clean, clean sweeps in the city of Missoula. Generally, tents can provide about 10 to 20 additional degrees of warmth and protect against damp or, or wet conditions. And a sleeping bag or a sleeping liner can provide an additional 15 to 25 degrees. This is life-saving warmth that shouldn't be taken away. In extreme heat, the risks of heat-related illness may be higher for unhoused folks due to a lack of access to shade and water, and the complicated interactions between medications, mental health, and substance use. Additionally, folks who fear being swept may also move further afield away from clean water and cooler conditions. The goal of this ordinance is to ask the city to enshrine in, in city policy the removal uh, and pause the removal, dismantling of, or forced movement of shelter and belongings during or right before extreme weather to ensure that people aren't put in a dangerous position. Taking a person's shelter away obviously exposes them to the elements, but forcing them to move from a shaded location to an unshaded location during extreme heat, or moving a tent that's sheltered by bushes to one that's open to the wind and extreme cold or a snowstorm, for example, also puts a person's healthy and safety, health and safety at risk. All right, so that was Nicole Gomez talking a little bit more about that. Just from the humanitarian pro, uh, side of things, they, um, uh, the main takeaway is the risk of being evicted from your tent. If only temporary could immediately impact those folks beyond their ability to stay in shelters where some of them may have access issues, whether from being uh, fiercely independent in some cases or having what's called an out for behavioral issues. Um, Aaron Pian spoke about these policies um, in reaction to some of the comments. So I, our policy today, first and foremost, is to engage in camp cleanups. It is not our policy to, quote, sweep any of these areas. Our goal is always to go in and to clean up an encampment without having to displace the people in that encampment. So it is not our goal to tear down and remove tents. It is not our goal to remove or dispose of RVs. It's our goal to clean up the area. Um, if we're unable to accomplish that, uh, we do work with the RV owners or the folks who are inhabiting the tent if they're there at that time after proper thorough noticing um, to try to engage in that cleanup. Um, and if we can't, we do take down tents, we store personal belongings. We are legally obligated to save and store those materials for a period of time. We cannot just throw them away or dispose of them. And we often provide assistance to folks in RVs either by towing them further down the street or around the block which allows us to then get in and clean that street of the health hazards that have been identified, which is primarily uh, the dumping of sewage onto our streets with RVs. Um, so and so uh, essentially, um, one of the things is like, it, a lot of this can be um, complicated, uh, you know, like George Carlin went and said, and I'll censor myself, uh, your stuff is crap and my crap is stuff. Uh, overall, the main argument to have this resolution is to have those guarantees that Aaron Pian mentioned in these last comment in writing, displacement, avoidance, and overall balancing persons' individual liberties and hazardous waste management. So far, this is ongoing. It will be uh, in committee further for discussion. Um, so that's pretty much it for all my comments. Um, all the videos I'm going to show you guys, Land Leach and Planning talked a lot of things that are affecting um, mobile homes and trailer parks in the last decade and the state updated this information. And so far it's been over 10 years and, um, and actually it's almost been uh, 15 years 
Um, so as of August 2008, uh, Title 16 was updated, and this is for the allowance of mobile um, manufactured kind of housing units to be on there. And House Bill uh, 4, uh, I mean, for, uh, House Bill 246 was adopted. It included an amendment to the definition of manufactured housing. Overall, this would allow for a smoother process in creating a mobile park overall. They spent this whole meeting going over the details, but this is another one of those meetings that doesn't necessarily require a lot of comment. So if you want to start a mobile home, you'll have to go through the City County Health Department for approval and basically converting a lot of your uh, lots and subdividing your lands. I think the ruling is is that you have to have at least 15 feet of space just outside the uh, mobile par um, mobile units to justify a larger mobile park. So this is actually encouraging for people who want to start their who want to um, basically buy land and to start their mobile uh, housing project there if they wish to do so. So look into that if you're interested in doing that kind of stuff because that's uh, basically the uh, the old school way of how they uh, dealt with affordable housing in the past. So up next, we do have a series of new programs that are airing on MCAT and that you can access them anytime on YouTube. And for without further ado, here is all a little taste of what you guys are missing out on through MCAT programming. And the light came on. Oh, was I ever scared. There were daddy long legs everywhere. I was laying on them, in them. They were hanging from the roof, two and three in a bunch. Uh, and they were all over my arms, all over. They were all over, everywhere. Have you ever tried to back up on crawling? Crawl backwards, somebody. I want to see somebody crawl backwards. <laughs> I, I wished I'd had a picture, because I was really crawling backwards <laughs> as fast as I could. And I got out, and of course, I got all the daddy long legs off of me as many as I could. And uh, looked around a little bit more, and that old mine is, is uh, something that we, I remember a long, I have remembered a long time. And I haven't really told that story to too many. I didn't have any wranglers with me because uh, we, I was just watching the horses. I was a wrangler. I, was. Uh, I guess I should just back up for those of you who don't know the WIC program. We are a special supplemental nutrition program. We supply food benefits to our families as well as nutrition education and referrals. We're designed to meet the special nutritional needs of people during pregnancy, breastfeeding, and early childhood, so from birth until age five. Um, and we do think we're one of the most effective public health programs in doing that. We're celebrating 50 years this year, and we're happy to be bringing about almost $20,000 to the Missoula County area um, for, the, for the local produce. So. so. As he, McGinley was talking to his colleagues, getting ready to make an issue about whether we were going to levy 77.9 mills or 95 mills, the Montana Quality Education Coalition sued 56 counties in the Supreme Court. I have a present. We're not mad at him for that. This is a Mako mug with a Mako pan that I'm giving to him because I haven't seen him since they filed the suit. And then concurrently, Governor Gianforte picked Missoula County to sue in district courts. So we were sued. You, I would not we, you were sued. In district court of Missoula, we collectively were sued in the Supreme Court. And the issue is this for us on the county side. We were not attacking school funding. It was not about trying to minimize the amount, the appropriations that were set in the biennium about what money went to schools. It, didn't, it wasn't supposed to impact local funding. It wasn't supposed to impact state funding. And what you're mostly doing is charging a lot of money for concessions. That was sort of the model back then. As you can imagine, and as you know, uh, it just didn't make it, you know. Um, at that time, there were 40 screens in Missoula. There was the Wilma still playing films. Carmike had three different movie theaters with a nine, with a three, with a 12. You know, there was like a lot of other competition. And that was all first run movies. And then eventually, around the, the real demise for the Roxy was when Carmike opened their own dollar show.
but it's never bothered me. All right, we are back. We're talking about some movies that are coming out this weekend. We're kicking things off with Arthur the King, which you think that it's like Arthurian tale of like uh, knights and everything like that. Wrong, completely, utterly wrong. They're all talking about some dog and their journey across the country. Uh, so we have Mark Wahlberg dipping his toes in. Uh, based on a true story, the best of true stories, comes Arthur and the King, which you'd think that would be Knights of the Round Table, period piece. But this piece is sometime, somewhere in 2016, written based on a book that may or may not be real because when I looked into it a little bit more, it was just like, huh, the, I guess there's only a Wikipedia article about the book that this movie is based on. Okay, whatever. Anyways, in the vein of A Dog's Journey or A Dog's Purpose or Homeward Bound or whatever, the long distance Iron Man competition is in full strength as they're going multiple miles across a country but a stray dog starts following him around because maybe one of them feeds him or whatever. And so this whole uh, inspirational journey, inspirational, because this is those kind of movies that have a dog, um, so there's always going to be inspirational. I've never seen a, a, a dog movie um, that comes out that's not somewhat inspirational and or sad at the same time. Uh, you know, hey, I'm just looking for the uh, Operation Dumbo Drop 2 movie to come out. And I did double check. They never made a sequel, not even for uh, streaming or video on demand. Maybe someday. Hey, 90s are coming back. Um, hey, did you guys see the uh, new uh, The Crow trailer? A lot of people hate because they have so much um, uh, blind love for the uh, former Brandon Lee. Anyways, this next movie coming out is something that I don't feel comfortable saying, but I'll just say it in this other way. The American Society of Magical Black People. They use the other word. Uh, this movie uh, must have been um, watched uh, that HBO show, Lovecraft County, because they got magical black people at the center of this film as they adapt, adopt a street kid who's exposed to magic and then a magical society behind the scenes every day. Hmm, seems like they're co-opting Harry Potter. But this movie is very much a little bit different because it's the idea that black people have to appease white people so they can keep their magical powers. There's your plot. That's essentially it. So you have this one guy who uh, works for this uh, tech company, and he makes, has to make friends with this really sad white guy and basically encourage them and all that kind of stuff. So no, this is not a joke. This is kind of crazy. So uh, enjoy all the stereotypes black people think us white people go um, going on in this one, but still it's a very interesting to treat people with different skin like they're animals in a zoo. Uh, anyways... Uh, <laughs> Uh, then we got our final movie, which I honestly think this was made by Chat GPT or AI or whatever. Just because you know, I see the poster and everything like that. It really, it's like very much just like write a 1990s summer comedy. Um, so you know, it's raunchy, over the top when trying to get the gal because having normal conversations with hot girls is impossible, especially for teenage boys. Overall, this is a summer job at a swimming pool where you get the idea of teens responsible for your children because they're too busy to. Uh, <laughs> because you're too busy to watch it themselves. Um, this happens in a Nebraska city, which are uh, which is actually in Nebraska. Take a hint, Kansas City. At least Oklahoma City is correct, and we can uh, not forget Virginia City in Montana, except always. Uh, even I sometimes don't believe in Virginia City exists. So anyways, I honestly have no idea what this movie is about. It seems like it's a, a total, like, just... Uh, um, tax write-off kind of movie. So anyways, those are the movies that are coming out this weekend. Up next, we have a new dub and stuff from a colorized movie, uh, High Tide, uh, from the 1947 crime drama. There we go. Hey, Deb. How you doing today? I'm fine. Oh, your shoulders are looking extra pointy today. Well, my secret is a lot of starch. Hopefully not too much, Starch right? prices are going up. Uh, everything's going up these days. Don tootin'. I have some water. What the heck happened here? Yeah, we went to that new Asian place. A lot of salt. Ah, uh, gee, Chief, you gotta take care of yourself. You have high blood pressure. Who do you think you are, my daughters? Uh, you know me, whenever there's a new uh, restaurant. Yeah, that and deep fried food, like the bloomin' onion you eat every day for lunch. Well, um, well, onions are a vegetable. You're not going to put an onion in your sock, are you, sir? Why, do you smell something? Uh, let me just, uh, just... Captain, you should move! Sir, I just saw an onion fall out of your sock. Uh, well, maybe you should get back to work instead of judging me of how do I do things for my health. I looked it up in a magazine. Uh, no, that was a lie. I saw it in an ad for an article in the, uh, New York Times or whatever, but... I don't know, maybe it was just more spam that they're trying to... Pedal us on further and further. 
maybe to think that we're safe, and then we just end up buying more frozen pizza. Well, the craziest thing in all this is the fact that you have a New York Times subscription, or perhaps you just uh, turned off your ad block for a second. I think the pieces are coming together in this one. What's going on here? Chief's high blood pressure. Come on, Chief. Take it easy. You're going to get a stroke or a heart attack. Yeah, I know. I'm not as young as I used to be. Doc, is there some kind of magic pill I should be taking? You're not taking the medication I prescribed? What I say about making me look like an idiot? Don't. And uh, besides, I ran out of that medication and I was too embarrassed to go get some more. I'll go get the medication for you, sir. Well, sir, I didn't come here to check on you on your blood pressure. I just wanted to say that there was a case, I gave up, and I don't really care about solving this case anymore. Why do we hire you anyways? I think it was nepotism. Meh? How dare ya? I know how to solve cases, it's just this one is a little bit more complicated. You can't give up every time the suspect asks for a lawyer. I don't know, it just makes us look like fools. Ugh. Well, maybe you can just file some paperwork. You get some, uh, you know, some stuff done, after all. Well, he is illiterate. Hmm. Do you learn those in your fancy books? Uh, it's like I'm living through the Police Academy movies. Does that make me Steve Gutenberg? Well, you're definitely not Winslow, making all those woo 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 sounds. All right, Henry, you're going to promote Deb to uh, detective, and uh, you're going to be the secretary, okay? Mm. Well, this is what true democracy in a police station looks like. We all vote to see who's going to be the chief, the officer, the detective, all sorts of things. Oh, yeah, fine, I guess. Does that mean you have to have those shoulder pads? Why you got to help me like that? Well, the chief has final say until, you know, the end of the week when we do the revote. Well, I never really thought of it that way, but sure, why not? Deb has all sorts of fashion sense. Does that mean he has the power to take lunch orders or whatever? Because, you know, I have a very specific diet. Oh, uh, don't worry, I'll get you your crab cakes like you always get. All right, sir, just please, please promise me you're going to take care of your health. Well, I guess I could. Whatever. Ow, that hurts. Well, you know what? This kind of reminds me. There's this new smoothie place that just opened. Well, if they have crab cake smoothies, I'm totally down for that. Let's go. Mm-hmm. Oh, I just realized what you just said. Gross. Hey, guys. Welcome back. We're going to... Uh, rush towards the end because I have no more videos I got to show you guys. So we're going to jump right into uh, your events that are going on uh, today and tomorrow um, and also this weekend. Uh, it is St. Patrick's Day weekend. A lot of the uh, St. Patrick uh, festivities are going to be happening all day Saturday with some happening on Sunday for the more traditional um, Irish day because they usually happens on the 17th of March. And so um, like, um, you know, it is next week is the spring break week. Uh, most kids got this day off today. They got early release on Thursday, but um, MCT is doing what's called a play in a day, in which uh, it is a, uh, a quasi-glorified activity-based um, um, activity for parents to drop off their kids for the regular MCPF day off, depending if the teacher is doing catch-up work, holiday observations. MC put on the supplemental activities-based uh, babysitting programs, and it starts at 9 a.m. this morning. Uh, sourdough Baking uh, Lifelong Learning Center is uh, does a, b a bunch of different kind of classes, other things. Uh, a lot of times they do the baking classes in conjunction with the uh, Missoula Food Bank, which opens around 10 a.m. for people who are looking to get access to their grocery store and uh, not really uh, break their wallet or break the bank while getting groceries. Um, Sterler Strides Mommy and Me workout class is uh, happening at the Barner Park at 9.30. They do this every Friday. Um, indoor fun, Mismo Gymnastics, uh, Root Tiger Sports Center, YMCA are plenty of fun indoor spaces. Uh, weather's getting a lot warmer outside, so a lot of great opportunities for people to get out and play. Um, but these are some of the indoor stuff if you still want your kid to stay a little bit warmer um, during um, the uh, se seasonal changes. So. Uh, Tiny Tales and Storytime every Friday at 10.30 a.m. It's a great way for get, uh, getting kids exposed to books who are under um, uh, ed, um, elementary school age. Easter Bunny at the Southgate Mall is kicking off at 11 a.m. at the Southgate Mall. 
uh, lunch at the Senior Center at, and at the Paul Varela Center at 11.30 a.m. A senior Center is a great opportunity for retired folks to get uh, meals, nutritious meals at the, the Missoula Senior Center. Also one of the best dance floors and also destroy people at Bridge or Cribbage, depending on your, pick your poison. And then the Paul Varela Center does a bunch of uh, breakfast, lunch, and dinners there for people who are struggling um, with uh, shelter. And so they have these opportunities for people to get food along that way. Uh, Yarns is happening at 12 noon on the fourth floor in the Blackfoot boardroom at the Missoula Public Library. This is a great opportunity for people who want to keep working on projects, meet other people who stitch and crochet. Uh, Hands-on science, magic of chemistry at Spectrum Discovery Center. Uh, so that's their topic. They're going to talk about chemistry this afternoon. They have new topics every day. They uh, host this from 10 a.m. to about 6 p.m. Uh, during the open hours of the library. Um, and this happens Tuesday through Saturdays. Lego Club and after school meals. And so this is something that this uh, library has been doing in conjunction with the food bank. Um, uh, Lego Club usually happens at 2.30, but they're also having after school meals for kids who want to have some additional food at this time. Young Adults Writers Group at 3.30 p.m. This is a great way for kids to uh, learn to write uh, beyond just reading. Uh, Jordan Smith, Imagination Brewing Company is going to be uh, performing some multi-genre music. The Gravy Ladies is going to be at the Old Post, um, also doing some jam band music as well. Karaoke at the Jack Saloon. Um, Need I say more? Starting at 7 p.m. Uh, the play that goes wrong. It's the last weekend. This is a big play that's happening at MCT Missoula Community Theater. They have the Children's Theater, which is doing the play in the day, but uh, tonight uh, they're doing their uh, the play that goes wrong, which is based on the same uh, writers and same plays that made Avenue Q, the uh, raunchy puppet musical. And so the play that goes wrong is essentially a play about a play. It's very inception-y, and it's going to go on tonight at 7.30 p.m. They had their show last night, and then this weekend they're going to have two shows on Saturday and two shows on Sunday with, the, with uh, both having matinees around 2 o'clock. Bear Bait Dance, a small uh, shift in the uncomfortable places. And so this is some contemporary dance um, performances happening in the Westside Theater this weekend. It is also their last weekend before spring break. Um, Aquaphobia, Echoes, and Resurrection, a two-day short uh, play festival, Zach Does Theater. And room three, uh, room uh, 131 is a play that is dedicated to providing a platform for their work. Actually, room 131 is the organization that wrote this play, uh, and this is to uh, enhance and help showcase Missoula writers. So I want to reiterate, room 131 is a organization in which um, is a collective of Missoula writers that help write plays in which they'll be performing Aquaphobia, Echoes, and Resurrection. Uh, and it's going to happen for two days. Uh, weekend at Monks. If you're interested in going to Monks tonight, they're going to do electronic music. It's for the club seekers out there uh, starting at 8 p.m. And then Josh Gooley live at Cranky Sam Public House. And it's going to be some uh, multi-genre music as well. Saturday markets, uh, run for the luck of it. As every time that there is some kind of parade, there always seems to be some kind of marathon. And at the fairgrounds, they're going to be hosting a marathon starting at 8.45 a.m. But I also want to mention that they have the regular Saturday market starting at 8 a.m. Orchard Homes has theirs around 10 a.m. to about 3 p.m. off of 3rd Street, uh, actually off of Reserve and 3rd, um, as you're going towards uh, Tower Street or uh, Wheat, Montana. Uh, Butterfly Release, they do this every uh, Saturday, uh, most days at 10.30 a.m. at the Missoula Butterfly House in the Exeterium. Uh, they also do some predator feeding sometimes at 3.30 in the afternoon. You can check online for those times and more. Western Montana Geological Society Workday. If you're interested in learning about your uh, family's ancestry, this is the place to do it here at the Public Library. They usually do it on the fourth floor, starts at noon. You can talk to other genealogists and figure out the, uh, where your uh, family comes from. A nature journaling at the uh, Spring Egg Equinox, the Natural History Center at noon on uh, Saturday as well. Um, the 42nd Annual St. Patrick's Day Parade. MCAT will be a part of this one. It start, the step off is at noon, so they'll be closing down the streets around 11.30, 11 11.45. Uh, they'll be lining up near the red X's and yeah, so and also, at the same time, MCAT will also be hosting a Saturday drop-in for kids interested in stop animation. This goes on from 1 to 3 p.m. every Saturday. And also, the Montana Natural History Center does another activity for kids, and they're going to be featuring bears this time around. Uh, intro into Coiled Bakistry, a technique. Missoula Art Museum artist um, is going to be featuring professional artist Lily Luna Bennett teaching a coiled basketry techniques using repurposed jeans denim. The finished product will display at MAM's Leela Audio uh, Education Gallery and uh, participants will take home a detailed illustrated tutorial. So 
that they can make their own baskets and all are using denim or other materials at home. And uh, the Rhino Bar is hosting an Irish whiskey pipe band and food after the parade. If you're interested in still um, coasting off the uh, good vibes from the uh, parade, Irish Dancing with Carol Henderson School of Irish Dancing at the Missoula Public Library starting at 3 p.m. Join dancers at the Carol Henderson School of Dance in, at the St. Patrick's Day performance, followed by introductory class le uh, dance lessons appropriate for all ages. Uh, so the uh, this Irish dancing was founded in 2016 by Laurel Lauren uh, Carol Bolger, Bolger sorry um, Laurel and her um, fellow instructors aim to foster community friendship teamwork confidence uh, and discipline through this teaching and traditional artistic and competitive style of Irish dancing um, you can go to cherishdance.com for more information 6 p.m. we're gonna kick things off with some music happening tonight imagination brewing company is doing good old-fashioned featuring folk music there multi-genre music is going to be featured at the draft works the benevolence are going to be playing there nashville 406 at the jack saloon playing some country music and the consistent uh, folklore society contra dance is going to be the elks ballroom it's kind of like old folk dancing um, weekend at monks they're going to be uh, continuing their uh, electronic music saturday at 8 p.m jazz night saturdays with umbrella theory staven hoop at 8 p.m uh, solid snake karaoke in the uh, the bulldog lounge west side lanes and fun center um, DJ Chris Moon every Saturday at um, 10 p.m. at the Badlander. And then, of course, Sunday is the official St. Patrick's Day parade, uh, St. Patrick's Day, not to be confused with the parade that happens every Saturday. Um, and so they're going to be featuring um, uh, St. Patrick's Day and against the draft work starting at 10 a.m. Um, at noon, they're going to have some bluegrass music, um, St. Patrick's Day party featuring the, the Pat Strings at uh, playing some bluegrass um, there as well. Um, Pato Creativity, the St. Patrick's Day Art Bash at the ZAC, um, the Metal a Feast of St. Patrick's a Bone Mass, the New Nightmare Alclave at the ZAC Late Night Metal Show. And so they're going to be doing some late night metal, hardcore uh, St. Patrick's Day shenanigans happening on Sunday. So those are the, some of the things that are happening this weekend and more. I'm going to jump right into some news things. And um, Sunday was the Oscars, but... Uh, the thing about the Oscars is that it happened, it felt like it happened almost uh, a, a year ago at this point. But one of the things that our own uh, Lily Gladstone out of Brownie, Montana, didn't win the Oscar for Best Actress, which is sad for Montana, as Emma Stone won for Poor Things as a Frankenstein esque monster in a Terry Gilliam type of film. If you ever watch a Terry Gilliam film, like, you know, Time Badness and stuff, you kind of get the vibe from this thing in terms of Poor Things. I haven't seen Poor Things, but um, it's interesting. But I did see Flowers Like Killer Moon. It's a little long, and, and I can see why um, Lily Gadstone didn't win the Oscar. She could have won for a, like a supportive actress, because for the most part, Leonardo DiCaprio and Le uh, Robert De Niro's, uh, it was their story about them uh, taking advantage of the Osage tribe in Oklahoma, based on a true story, um, and based on the book, Killers of the Flower Moon. Overall, Oppenheimer swept most of the trophies with very little love in general for Killers, but Hayao Miyazaki got a second ever win for The Boy and the Heron for Best Animated Feature, beating out fan favorite Across the Spider-Verse, which in my opinion leaned too hard on setting up a sequel. Barbie won for Best Song for Billie Eilish, who uh, also made uh, uh, a very first for the Oscars, winning two Oscars at the age of 22, being one of the youngest uh, two-time Oscar winner. And there's a little... Uh, too much pop culture for you, I need to throw up. But I will mention that uh, the two re recipients of the award uh, for a, Ukraine, uh, a Ukrainian director of, for, of a documentary film that talked about the first 20 days in Kviv when uh, the Russia invaded Ukraine, um, he mentioned that um, he wished he never would have made that documentary and he wished he could have done everything he could to uh, help support Ukraine. And he asked for the people to continue the support for Ukraine as they're continuing the fighting. But the one thing that definitely overshadowed that was the Jewish director, Jonathan Glazer, who did the zone of interest, which is basically um, the uh, concept of bureaucracy during the uh, genocide or of the Jewish people during the Holocaust. So um, he spoke against the genocide in Gazan people and condemning Israel to turning a blind eye to the humanitarian crisis that is growing there as well. The director of zone of interest follows a group of Nazis who live near a concentration camp and the normal boring lives as genocide was happening in their backyard. Overall, he said he refuted his Jewishness and those who would use the Holocaust to justify 
justify another Holocaust. While we're in this, uh, the U.S. Uh, dropping aid, uh, there has been instances in which while uh, U.S. has been dropping aid, IDF has been dropping bombs, and plenty of eyebrows have been raised with soldiers uh, building a pier in a war zone to supply aid rather than for forcing Israel to allow aid into the uh, country from the Rafah border. There is some issues of having U.S. soldiers in a region in a dangerous area where they're supplying aid is potentially risking their lives for this continued war that is frankly is very one-sided at this point. Even so, Chuck Schumer, the Senate Majority Leader, spoke out on Thursday just yesterday uh, against Benjamin Netanyahu and their extreme right-wing government saying that they are standing in the way of peace. In the 40-minute speech of the Senate floor, the once staunch supporter of Israel uh, and Jewish himself stated uh, uh, Israel cannot survive if it becomes a pariah. Uh, Israeli Ambassador Michael Herzog called the speech counterproductive to our common goals, end quote. This was also a GOP opportunity to speak in favor of Israel and that the U.S. has showed solidarity for the way that Israel is conducting their operation. This week saw a movement of potentially a movement of 1.4 million people into a safe zone while the AIDF looks for, to invade Rafah for the last bits of southern Gaza to which they will eliminate Hamas once and for all. Uh, protesters in Israel are also causing for early erections uh, that have uh, charged that Netanyahu is making decisions based on keeping his right-wing coalition intact rather than Israel's interest in times of war. So we're going to jump right in back to Missoula and um, talking about a lot of different things. And of course, as we get further into our season, um, we're going to be seeing that $7 million levy uncertainty for uh, insurance rates will cause them to climb as well. Uh, Gordy Hughes, the fire chief, has fielded nearly twice as many calls since 2012, with the same amount of totaling 80 full-time staff firefighters, and this levy would support 20 uh, firefighters and more. However, these numbers do not reflect the increased city growth as the tax base increase has not increased tax revenue for the city. Um, we're growing, but th uh, in the uh, facade only. And like I always say, if you build it, the staff will be spread thin. The last minute veto, our government tossed out House Bill 442, has come to con some consensus. Judge Mike M Manahan, ruling of March 5th, uh, does not guarantee that the lawmakers will be able to override Gene Forte's veto of Senate Bill 442, legislation that allocated tax revenue for marijuana sales to uh, conservation veterans and county infrastructure programs, but it does start a 14-day clock for the governor and Montana Secretary of State to initiate a vote to override the veto, appeal the district court, and blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. So the whole idea behind this is that uh, Greg Gianforte vetoed a bill pretty much an hour before the Senate uh, closed, and so they had to vote on it or could extend the uh, legislature to uh, end the vote, but they didn't, and that basically tied the hands of our Secretary of State to initiate a new veto vote because if the governor vetoes something after legislation session, then they have the power to uh, override the vote overall, but they weren't able to do it because it was the, one of the weirdest loopholes. So this judge essentially would allow for uh, an extension to be able to uh, untie the hands of the Secretary of State. So effectively, this ruling takes Gene Fito's, Gene Forte's, our governor's veto out of the question and puts it back to the back into veto after the session so the state secretary of state can issue a poll for override. Makes sense? Not really. But Gene Forte, especially during the pandemic, did not utilize ARPA funds to the fullest when he's done um, complaining about migrants on Fox News. So this bill had an overwhelming support to use marijuana money to invest in co conservation roads and other various other entity entities to alleviate our tax burden. And speaking of alleviating the tax burden, the Build Back Better has offered Missoula the uh, $24 million grant for the East Missoula Tor Corridor, which many years have were single lanes going to and from Missoula. Uh, the whole idea is that they want to extend this. It goes, goes right underneath a railroad track. And so the being able to build this out is very complicated. And so Missoula was granted $24 million to get, $24 million to get this infrastructure built out for wider roads and bike lanes that go under the train tracks. Apart from the downtown Higgins hip strip to the main front conversion, $28 million in grants and $35 million towards public transportation to effectively convert a majority of city buses to full electric. So the city is basically effective, uh, effectively working with more than $100 million in the city alone for infrastructure aid for roads and transportation, and that's uh, because of the Build Back Better through the Biden plan. And plans for Highway 200 through East Missoula going back into the, uh, the um, East Missoula corridor includes uh, street, uh, street uh, 
improvements to like bike lanes, sidewalks, boulevards, and lighting. They also include a roundabout in the I-90 interchange and work on railroad uh, bridge to create more room underneath for both pedestrians and passing vehicles. Senator John Tester uh, helped this process along while well, roads are getting these big funding deals. Tester is also looking toward affordable housing solutions with the state of Montana. The medium cost for a house in uh, Missoula hit a record high this year with $579,000, while in Bozeman is now sits at $762,000. Unless you get a home before 2020, then the idea of buying a home is further and further away unless you make $130,000 a year like most Brazilians don't, uh, which uh, they're lucky to make uh, 60000 a year. Um, I believe in supply and demand, Tester said. Uh, we're $3.8 million, uh, 3, 3 million houses too short. And until that comes up, until we fix that supply problem, we're going to see housing prices continue to elevate faster than a lot of other things. And um, 3.8 million houses in the state of Montana seems very excessive since there's only roughly 1.2 million in the entire state of Montana. Just thinking about that, but sorry, I'm going off the cuff. But nationally, nationally the median home price is $412,000, while Montana sits at 530000 for the medium home price. I believe we should look into multi-ownership over individuals owning one home because the idea of that companies are buying up residents to force folks to pay rent has contributed to this problem. And if I had uh, it my way, I would create a Families First Act and it would be used to connect homes to homes before organizations influence supplies. I honestly believe that there is going to be a major fallout in housing when the baby boomers begin to age out of their homes and there is going to be a major empty housing shortage. This also harkens back to Wall Street playing these games since uh, Xi'an Capital shorted the housing market, which collapsed. The same organization with uh, Warren Buffett, Berkshire Hathaway, um, is teamed up with Michael Burry with the Cheyenne, who used to work for Cheyenne Capital, uh, currently bet on Wall Street to collapse to the S&P and NASDAQ. So you, you, you know it's kind of interesting when the guy who uh, uh, called the uh, housing crisis is also going uh, is teaming up with Warren Buffett to call against the collapse of the S&P and NASDAQ. So just think about that. A lot of people got rich and a lot more people lost their homes during the housing crisis. And if you're a publicly traded company that doesn't increase profit by 3% every year, you're not, you're not doing it right. Reaganomics in action and Bidenomics, as you might see it through uh, those attack ads, to tester has not made a dent in years to hedging and shorting and even when people invest in places like GameStop they still can't win. It's a rigged system because you can't win either way and when the companies even lose they win. So it's, it's, it's a very interesting time that we're definitely living in and there definitely has to be a major reform not just in the housing but just overall to make sure that um, every dollar that we save is not being squeezed out of us. So that's how I want to end my show and I want to thank you guys for joining me this morning and for Wake Up Missoula I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a wonderful weekend. And check out the Buddy DeFranco Jazz Festival. It's going on all day today for clinics and more for a bunch of those students getting a rich education. Not to mention, they're going to do their uh, last performance tonight at 7.30 p.m. at the Denison Theater.